So, here we are continuing with that convex sets, convex hulls and linear separability. In the last video actually we have discussed about what is actually a convex sets and what is a convex hull and what is meant by linear separability, we will be continuing with this. So, a convex hull we are actually defining here, a set of points in a Euclidean space, right, it is going to be a normal space and uh, it is defined as to be convex, if it contains the line segments connecting each pair of its points, right. Say for example, we are going to have some general space and we will be having some points, right, which is actually a set of x and when all these points are inside a small point, small section, then that is actually called as a convex hull, right. Say put a rubber band, right, say these are all some nails and you put a rubber band over that, so that it will occupy the minimum space that covers all these nails that can be considered as a convex hull. And the convex hull of a given set x may be defined, so what are actually the de possible definitions we can have it. The first thing is the unique minimal convex set containing the points or dots available in the set x. The intersection of all convex sets, suppose if we connect any two points from here, right, everything should be available inside that range, inside that border, that is again actually a convex set. The set of all convex combinations of points, that is again a convex hull and then the union of all simplices, what is actually a simplices? A simplices may be a simple geometrical shape, something like if a simplex 0 is actually a dot, a simplex 1 is actually a line, a simplex 2 is actually a triangle. So, we can call any uh, geometrical shape as some simplex or simplices and so all these union of all these simplices with some vertices available in that any point at x, right, uh, that is actually x is a set. So, these are all actually called as the convex hulls. The next thing we are going to see is about the linear separable classes and the separating hyperplane. Normally, when we, we are going to have a two dimensional data, right, and that is actually divided into two categories, something like C1 and C2, then we can simply insert a simple line in between which can separate these two classes, right. So, for example, category 1 and category 2 or class 1 or class 2 whatever it is, right. Suppose if it is going to be multidimensional, right, say more than two dimension is actually there, then in those cases a simple line cannot actually divide it. In that case, we will be having a hyperplane which divides the set of data. So, here we will see the two pattern sets x i and x j right. So, this is actually we can call it as an x 1 and x 2 whatever may be the value here and are said to be linearly separable if they are convex hulls. So, again what is actually a convex hull? So, x i is actually a set and all the points or all the data that is available in this set are actually circle I mean uh, closed by this group that is called c 1. Similarly, there is actually an x j again a set of points will be there and all these points are actually circumvented by this c 2 portions and this is actually a convex hull and this is actually a convex hull and when these two things can be easily separated by a plane, right, then that is actually called as the separating hyperplane. So, when I can have a simple straight line, then we can say it is actually a linearly separable classes. So, these two classes can be linearly separable. And one separating hyperplane is the perpendicular bisector of the straight line joining the closest two points, right. So, what is actually the closest point between these two things? Maybe we can consider this and this, right. So, this is actually the shortest path. So, we are going to have a vertical line which is going to separate these two classes, right. So, we can call this as a linearly separable classes, right, of two sets. One is actually the category 1, class 1 other one is category 2, class 2 and these two are two convex hulls. Hulls in the sense it is actually a covered portion of all the set values available in that particular set, yeah. So, here actually we can see a space of Boolean functions. Normally, what is actually Boolean? Boolean means actually a logic functions which will contain only the binary values zeros or ones. So, we will be having a Boolean function it is going to be a n dimensional Boolean function is a map from the domain space that comprises 2 power n possible combinations of the n variables. Of course, we know that, right. Suppose if it is going to be 2 bits, right, then 2 power 2, 4 combinations are actually possible because the value may contain either it is going to be a 0 or 1. So, if there are going to be 2 bits are there, 
So, B square we will be having 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So, there may be 4 combinations. So, we can consider this as 0, 0, this is actually 0, 1, this is 1, 0 and this is 1, 1. So, these 4 values may be available and we are going to frame a uh, Boolean function, right, which is going to have different functions. Say for example, any logic gate we can consider. It can be a simple AND gate or OR gate, whatever it is available and the output of all these gates can be considered in this particular domain space. Now, we will get into this AND function. Of course, we know what is an AND gate. The AND gate is actually having the inputs of x1 and x2 and the output is going to be the function of this x1 and x2. When both the inputs are 0, the output will be 0. When any one of the input, either x2 is 1 or x1 is 1, again my output is going to be only 0. When both the inputs are 1, then in that case my output is going to be 1. Of course, we know the basic uh, truth table of an AND function, right. So, again it is represented in another way 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. For all the cases the output will be 0. For the output input 1 and 1, the output is going to be 1. Now, if we plot these values in a simple graph, so here actually what we can so do is we can take the x axis x1 in the x axis and the second input is there in the y axis and we are having 4 points. This is called 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 and 1, 1. So, these are all actually the 4 points. Now, what we are actually going to do is we are going to mark this 0 as a circle, right. So, here actually the values are going to be zeros. So, I am marking it as a circle and whenever I am going to have a 1, it is actually used as a filled circle, right. It is filled with some color, right. So, when I am going to have these values, now this is one category and this is another category. So, I should be able to separate these two categories. How I can do that? Now, I can actually draw a straight line like this. So, that if I draw the side straight line, then I can classify these two categories of outputs, right. So, that I can find out for what are all the categories I will be getting the uh, output as 0, for what are all the categories of input I will be getting the output as 1. So, this is actually a simple AND function which is linearly separable because using a simple line I can segregate what are all going to be the possible output cases. So, the same thing of course, can be represented as a binary neurons, right. That is actually called as a pattern dichotomizers and the dichotomizer is actually again it is a plane, right. We can divide it into so many parts. Now, here in this case we are going to have a simple neuron and the neuron input vector is going to be x1 and x2 which are going to be the two inputs x1 and x2. In addition to that we will be having a bias. So, the bias we are going to fix it at a constant one value. And we are going to consider three vector, three weights. So, W0, W1, W2 and W0 is actually the weight of the bias, W1 is the weight of the x1 and W2 is the weight of the x2. And this is going to be the first function which is just going to calculate the x1 into W1, x2 into W2 plus 1 into W0. So, these values will be accumulated here in this thing. And this is followed by some sort of function, some activation function. Already we have discussed what are all the different activation functions are there. First, we will see one by one. So, my output is going to be y, which is going to be the x transpose, where x is actually a vector, right. Since it is not going to be a single data, we can call it as a vector. And w is again, it is going to be a vector, right. So, instead of multiplying, say for example, x1 into w1 plus x2 into w2 like this instead of doing this, we can represent this simply using a uh, matrix function something like this. So, it is going to be w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w0 into 1 which is uh, my input from the bias, right. And we are going to have the neuron discriminant function where the y of x is going to be 0 if y is greater than 0 and s is equal to 1 and y is less than 0 when the value of s is equal to 0. So, normally we will be trying to fix it using a simple straight line. So, normally what is going to be the straight line equation? Y equal to m x plus c, right? Yeah, normally a yeah, straight line equation. So, we are going to fix it this output according to this straight line function. Yes, here we can see given a fixed set of weights, right? So, there are going to be a set of weights and the neuron fires a plus 1 signal. The plus 1 signal can be considered as a logic 1 signal for the inputs of x1 and x2 which yield positive activation, right. So, whenever there is a positive activation is there, when both my values of x1 and x2 are 1 and 1, then my output is going to fire as a plus 1. 
and fires a zero for other inputs that yield a negative activation. So, what is meant by negative activation when both the inputs are zero or any one of the input is zero in both the cases my output of the undergate is going to be uh, it is going to be zero. So, here actually it will be giving a negative activation and inputs are thus separated into two classes already we discussed. So, it is a one class for some outputs it is going to be one and zero class for some inputs it is going to be zero fine. So, the input satisfying the discriminant function yield is zero activation and in this case the discriminant function can be written as what is actually the x 2 x 2 can be written as w 1 divided by w 2 into x 1 minus w naught divided by w 2 right. So, this is actually the output of the function x 2 fine. So, in this case what we are going to do is again already I told you write y equal to m x plus c which is going to be the uh, sim simple straight line where uh, intercept and the slope are actually there right c is actually the intercept and the slope is actually the m. So, in, in this case what is going to be the slope? m is equal to minus w 1 divided by w 2 which is equal to minus 1. So, it is actually a negative slope with the 1. So, the here again it is 1.5, here again it is going to be 1.5. So, the slope value is going to be minus 1, it is decrementing that is fine. And what is going to be the intercept? This point of course, I am going to move it. So, where we can have it? Suppose I can draw a line something here, maybe from 1.2, here again I can have 1.2, even then it is separable it can be 1.5 to 1.5 whatever it is. So, we can fix it at different locations no issues for the time being we are going to consider my w naught is as actually 1.5 right. So, in that case actually what happens here? Yes, in that case actually what happens here? A neuron classifier that appro appropriately partitions the pattern space for the under classification. So, the value of this threshold is going to be minus 1.5. So, I should be able to find out a value so that I should be able to distinguish these three points which are going to give the 0 outputs from this point which is going to give 1 output right. So, I should be able to try a straight line between these two things and it need not be between 1.5 and 1.5 any value in between right. So, these are all actually different separating lines right. Say for example, there are going to be n possible n infinite possible combinations where I can draw a straight lines right. So, here actually in my case I have taken just minus 1.5. So, that I will be getting a straight line like this. So, in this case this is actually the my equation. So, m value is going to be the w 1 divided by w 2 is going to be uh, the value of 1. So, it is going to be minus x 1 plus my the c value is going to be 1.5. So, I have written x 2 is equal to minus x 1 plus 1.5. So, that I will be getting this particular line and here actually the pattern any pattern points on this side causes the neurons to fire a 0 signal. So, what does it mean? You take any value it need not be 0 or 1. Suppose if I take some value here right. So, which is going to be something around 0.4 here, 0.5 here. So, which is going to give the output only in the 0 region. Similarly, I can take any point here say for example, I have taken this point. So, this may be something like uh, what is going to be the value here and what is going to be the value here and what is going to be the output. So, in that case I should be able to find out any input the pattern points on this side causes the neuron to fire a 0 signal. So, in that case I will be getting a 0 signal at the output. And in this case whenever the point comes on the right hand side of this particular scope, then I will be having a 1 output will be coming here. So, in that case I am taking the intercept and the slope. So, it can be called as a linearly separable function. So, the geometrical design of an undeclassifier can be linearly separable fine. So, here uh, as I said here actually this, this threshold I have set it as 1.5. Now, it can be slightly adjusted. No, no issues even uh, even then I will be getting the similar output. So, here in that case I have the equation here and I have selected my intercept as 1.5. So, when I compute my output what is going to be the value? So, 0 and 0 according to this value the value of the q is going to be 0 and y is equal to q minus 1.4. So, it is minus 1.5 my s value the final output is going to be 0 and for the next case also my output is 0 it is negative number third case also it is a negative number my output is 0 and the positive case when I am giving 1 and 1 the output is going to be 2 and y is equal to 0 0.5 which is actually a positive number. So, I will be getting the output as 1. So, using this particular set of equations right since actually it is a equation 
we can linearly separate it. So, most of the cases linear means you can write it as an equation, you can write it as an expression. right? So, looking at this design problem S q plane, there should be 1 uh, only if q is equal to 2 and uh, 0 otherwise. right? So, here the signal function anywhere in the interval 1 comma 2 and uh, 1 plus epsilon and 2 minus epsilon get the appropriate results and our design plays to signal functions at 1.5. So, in that case we have drawn this particular threshold value as 1.5. Some there are some cases, right? Already we have discussed about the linearly separable cases. The first one is of course linearly separable, and there are some cases which cannot be linearly separated out, right? Say for example, here actually I have some convex hulls are available here, and there is actually some overlapping space. So in that case, these two things cannot be separated using a single straight line. So they are actually called as a non-linearly separable case. Here we can see the two convex hulls C1 and C2 of two pattern sets in figure A and uh, is sufficiently separated to ensure decision surfaces cover comprises only of the hyperplanes. So I have just drawn a hyperplane, and I can easily separate it. On the other hand, when convex hulls overlap as in the figure B, right? So here on the, on the right hand side the pattern sets become linearly non-separable, but may be non-linearly separable. So, when the system becomes non-linear, then we can have a non-linear cases using which I can separate these two things. We will just think of all these things in the future slides. We will see one such example for the non-linearly separable case. So, here actually XR is a classic example for this. Of course, you know what is an XR gate. So, for the XR gate, it is the value is going to be 0, 0, the output is going to be 0. For 0, 1 and 1, 0 case, it is going to be 1 and 1, and when the value is going to be 1 and 1, the output is going to be 0, right. So, this is called the exclusive R. So, the only R function will be realized. When the input is 1 and 1, again the output becomes 0. Now, if you draw the same thing, right, in the same graph, of course, I have taken. So, here instead of 2, 3 blank lines and 1 dotted line, here we can see 2 pink lines and 2 blue lines are actually available here. So, here again for 0, 0 the output is going to be 0, for 0, 1 the output is going to be 1, 1, 0 the output is going to be 1 and 1 and 1 the output is going to be 0. So, the geometry of this Boolean XR function shows that the two straight lines are required for the proper separation of these two classes. So, what we are going to do is, I cannot have one such classification, I need two straight lines. So, that I should be able to classify the region of 1s and the region of zeros. So, what is actually the theorem here? No single threshold logic neuron exists that can solve the XR problem. Why this theorem is there? This is actually the contradiction, the proof. And in the case of XR classification problem, it is equal to the simple modulo 2 addition, right? So, what is meant by modulo 2 addition? 1 plus 1 is going to be 0 with the carry of 1, right? So, that is actually the modulo 2 addition. So, in this case, assume a TLN with the weights W0, W1, W2, of course, are there and the inputs are going to be x1 and the x2. And for the XR, XR operation, what we have written is x1 exclusive R with the x2 will be 1 if w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus this w0 x1. Of course, w0 is actually the weight of the uh, bias and bias value is again we have set it as 1, the same assumption we can take it. So, that should be greater than or equal to 0. In that case, actually my output is going to be the XR function will be there. So, and since the model 2 arithmetic is uh, symmetric, so in that case actually what happens? We can uh, either use w1 x1 or we can also use w2 x2 x1, right? w1 x1 or w2 x1, both the things are symmetric. So, in that case actually we can write another equation, the x1 x r with x2 is also equal to 1 if the w2 x1 plus w1 x2 is also greater than or equal to minus w0. So, this implies this if key equation of course, we can write at w1 plus w2 divided by 2, which is going to be the average of these two things and w x plus w0 is greater than 0, where w is the w1 plus w2 divided by 2 and x is equal to x1 plus x2. So, we are going to have a simple arithmetic x1 plus x2. In the previous case actually what we thought 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. So, in that case I will be getting the output as 1. So, it is going to be a simple arithmetic. But here again 1 plus 1, it is going to be modulo 2 arithmetic. So, we will be getting a 0. So, in that case, we will be having a problem, right. So, in that case, the w x plus w naught is a first degree of polynomial in x. 
and which must be less than 0 for x of 0 that is for uh, with the both the inputs are 0 and 0. And when the input is going to be 0 and 1 the output should be 1 or the input is 1 and 0 the output should be 1 and less than 0 for the input 1 and 1 which is going to be x is equal to. So, when you are going to have a simple addition the 2 is actually ok. So, last time for AND gate we considered 1.5. So, that was working, but in this case when 1 and 1 is there the summation becomes 2, but it is going to be modulo 2 arithmetic. So, it should be 0 which is actually not possible here that is the problem and this is impossible since a first degree polynomial is monotonic and cannot therefore, change sign more than once. So, we thus conclude that there is no such polynomial and there is no TLN that can solve the XR problem. So, a simple neural network with the setup right a threshold logic network TLN stands for threshold logic network cannot solve a XR problem, but what are all the other possible ways we can solve this of course, we are going to see them right. This is actually one uh, a simple case how I can solve this XR problem. So, instead of taking a simple gate I am going to take two gates. So, the first one is going to be R the second one is going to be NAND. So, what is actually R for the R case my values are going to be 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 for the r case my output is going to be 0 1 1 1 for the and case the ulta right. So, it is going to be 0 0 0 1 for the nan case it is going to be 1 1 1 here the value is going to be 0 right. So, this is actually the output of the r and this is actually the output of the nand and if you can and these two things then what will happen actually 0 and 1 is going to be 0. 1 and 1 is 1, 1 and 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 0. So, we will be getting a XR gate. So, a simple XR gate can be uh, got by combining two things right. One is going to be an R gate and followed by a NAND gate and of course, the outputs of these two things again should be undead. So, we, we need one more gate right. So, here actually the combining R and a NAND neurons using a logical AND right and which can be implemented using a third binary neuron I need one more binary neuron for that the XR problem can be solved that is actually the case. Now, the same thing of course, is represented in this graph. So, this is going to be the single simple response of the R neuron. So, this is actually the R section this is going to be the NAND section and this is going to be the combination of these two things. So, you can have the XR or the ulta of this the reverse of this we can have the XNOR functions right. So, a XOR function can be realized using a R gate and NAND gate and followed by a AND gate. These three gates of course, we can combine to get a XOR function. So, this is going to be a simple circuit right or a network that can be useful for solving this XOR problem. So, it is a two layered network. So, here so far we have discussed about a single layers. Now, we are actually getting into two layer which is a part of the multi layer networks. So, here this can be considered as a layer 1, this can be considered as a layer 2 right. It is going to be a two layer network and the architecture to implement the XR function. So, as I already told you we are going to have your X 1 and X 2 functions are there and in that case we will be having W 1 1, W 1 2, W 2 1 and W 2 2. There are going to be four weights will be associated with that and there are going to be two bias plus 1 plus 1 and there is one more bias here and the weights corresponding weights are going to be W 0 1. W02 and W03 and this will implement a R function, this will have a NAND function and it will have a AN function. So, that I will be able to get the output of the XR fine. A more common three layered uh, version of the same network with the linear input layers shown explicitly. So, this can also be then of course, we have one more extra layer through which the data will be passing through. So, it is going to be a two layer and in this case it is going to be a three layered network which is going to useful for realizing the XOR function. And to gain the further insights we can just think of if we have a large number of dichomates right. So, dichom, uh, dichotomize and the probability that the TLN will be able to solve a classification problem increases. That is there is a large uh, I mean a dichotomizer is actually a line which separates two uh, classifications or two categories right. So, when we are going to have the large number of dichotomies. So, in that case there is a good possibility of differentiating these two classifi I mean uh, classifiers right or these two categories 
right so here actually the classification problem increases and there is a larger chance that some dichotomy will be able to solve the problem so you can easily separate two things and since a, a tln can solve only a linearly separable problem to solve a linearly non separable problem what we have to do we have to make it linearly separable so what are the two possible ways of doing that there are two possible ways one is going to be if somehow we have we can reduce the number of points p then it might be possible that mapping from the reduced set of points into the range of space may become linearly separable. So, what we are going to do is we are going to reduce the number of points. In the previous case there were four, four points. Suppose if I can reduce it to three points then whether I may be able to separate that is actually one possible way. The second possible way is we might increase the dimension since the number of possible linear dichotomies then increases right. Say for example, you suppose if it is going to be a 2D, we will go for the 3D, three dimensions. We can go for four dimensions. So, you try to increase the dimensions so that I will be able to find out what is going to be the difference. So, then increases and the probability that the linearly non separable problem at hand becomes linearly separable. So, we will explain these two points of course, in the next slides. Yes, so this is actually the first point reduce the number of points. So, here actually what we have done is of course, there is going to be uh, the same thing right whichever we have already taught. So, there is going to be R function is there, there is going to be a NUN function is there and the output is given to a AND function. So, that I can realize this particular XR gate right here what we will see the logical functions implemented by each TLN that the first layer nodes do not compute anything of course, these two things are just dummy nodes they do not compute anything fine and it is indicated in the figure and the XR problem can be solved in two steps. First, there is a mapping of function, mapping function right and there is one more mapping is available which is going to have this two points into single point. So, I will be reducing the number of points. Note that y is actually a function 1 of x and y 1 equal to x 1 plus x 2 and y 2 equal to x 1 into x 2. Of course, this is going to be the uh, r function here and y 2 is actually the and function here right. Now, what we are doing actually? So, my x 1 is there, x 2 is there y 1 is there, y 2 is there. Now, what we are going to do is they are going to map it right 4 points in the 2 D mapped 3 make the x r linearly separable. So, what, what we are going to do here we are having 0 1 point 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 is there. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to remove this 0 0. So, we will be having 0 1 1 0 1 1 by a suitable mapping here. How that mapping is done? by selecting this function yes. So, in that case instead of having four points I will be having only three points. So, in that case I can simply draw a line. So, this is actually a simple method by reducing the number of points because for both 0 1 as well as 1 1 I will be getting the 1 1 1. So, which I can reduce it here. So, this is one way of doing the thing. The second solution is you can increase the dimensions. So, instead of a two dimensional space, so you can go whether we can go for three dimensional space. Of course, the same thing is available here. So, what we are going to do is here actually we are going to have x 1 and x 2 is no problem. So, we will be having the first two digits x 1, x 2, x 1, x 2, x 1, x 2, x 1, x 2. So, it is going to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Now, in that case the x r is actually not separable. So, when I have only two dimensions, I will be getting the four points here 1, 2, 3, 4 points here. Now, what I am going to do is I am going to add one more variable here, one more dimension here which is actually x 3. What is the value of x 3? x 3 is actually the und function. So, when we und it, it is going to be 0, 0, 0 and the fourth value is going to be 1 and 1, it is going to be 1. Now, if you want to have this x r function, then you are going to have a hyperplane because since I am going to have all the three functions together, my simple 1 and 1 will become 1 1 1 which is going to be one more dimensions. So, these three things will be in the bottom uh, uh, plane and this 1 1 1 will be in the top plane. Assume this is actually a cube right. So, these three are actually in the bottom side of the cube and this one is actually the top cube and we can have a hyperplane of this shape which can be used to separate these two things right. So, here in this case I am going to add a simple und function 
which is going to give the third dimension for my application. And then we are going to discuss about the multi-layer networks. So, whenever I am going to have a XR, in some cases a simple TLN cannot be used in that case, you can go for the multi-layer networks. So, we are going to have more number of layers. So, the TLNs can be connected into multiple layers in a feed forward. Of course, the same feed forward uh, network is going to be there, but it is going to be a multi-layer network. And it is common to have more than one hidden layer when solving a classification problem, especially when one has a number of disjoint regions in the pattern space. So, already we have discussed, right? There are some cases when I am going to have a multiple points. In that case, actually, I can have so many regions available. So, in that case, we make the following observations for TLN with the two hidden layers apart from the input and output layer. So, there will be an input layer, there will be some output layer in between, you will be having one or more hidden layers. So, here each neuron in the first hidden layer forms a hyperplane in the input pattern space. Already we discussed in the previous slide, I think you might have seen. So, whenever I am going to have additional uh, layers, then each neuron uh, in the first hidden layer forms a hyperplane in the input pattern space. So, already we discussed, right. So, that is going to be the first layer is actually called as an input layer. The last layer is called as an output layer and any number of layer in between, right, it can be 1, 2, 3 or whatever may be the number, all these layers are actually called as the hidden layers, right. And a neuron in the second hidden layer can form a hyper region from the outputs of the first hidden layer. So, this is actually the input, the input is given to the first hidden layer, the output of the first hidden layer is given to the second hidden layer. So, whenever the data passes through from one layer to another layer, a separate hyper region can be formed, right. So, each and every layer can form one hyper region, right. So, the second layer of course, forms a hyper region from the outputs of the first layer neurons by performing the under operation of the hyper planes. And these neurons can thus approximate the boundaries between the pattern classes. The output layer neurons can then combine disjoint pattern classes into decision regions made by the neurons in the second hidden layer. So, we can have any performing a logical operations, you can combine these two things, the output of the first one, the output of the second one, so that I will be having a multi-layer network. And these are all some of the examples where I can have this multi-layer case. So, here actually I am going to have a single layer, a dichotomy is a single dichotomy is available, that is actually one separating line that separate this black and this white we can say or this is category 1 or that is category 2 C 1 and C 2. Then I am going to have a two layer function. So, this is actually we can call it as a layer 1 and this is a layer 2. Of course, this input layer is only a dummy layer, does not do any computation. In that case, I can have different shapes available here. And when you are, I am going to have a multi layer, something like a three layer function then you can have any arbitrary shapes, say for example, but there should be only two classifications, right. Say for example, this is black, this is white. So, only two categories of data are there, but any arbitrary shape of data is possible when I am going to have a three layer network, right. So, this is actually the geometry of a multi-layered TLN network. So, what is the theorem here? No more than three layers in the binary threshold feed forward network are required to form the arbitrary complex decision regions. So, in this case, whatever may be the complex decision region is possible, I can just manage with three layers. The only point is there should be only classifications as category 1 and category 2, otherwise we can very well do this. Yes, this is going to be the theorem. And there are going to be, when we are going to have a uh, multi-layer networks, Right. First actually we have to initially train or we have to train the network, the network should learn something, right. So, there are going to be two functionals, right. So, the two fundamental learning paradigms are available of course. Now, we are going to getting into the learning the neural networks, how the neural networks get some data, learn some data, right. That is what actually we are going to see now. Now, in this case there are going to be two fundamental learning paradigms. The first one is going to be the non-associative, the second one is called as the associative. So, what is meant by non-associative? It is an organism acquires the properties of a single repetitive stimulus and associative means an organism acquires knowledge about the relationship of either one stimulus to another or one or one stimulus to organism's own behavioral response. 
So, when associative means one action, what is going to be the reaction? We are going to learn something from that. So, there will be an association between the variable learning points and a non association, non associative means there is no learning or no, there is no association between the different learning points. So, this is what actually the non associative and the associative. Of course, we will explain them one by one now. Now, we will see the examples of the associative learning. First, we will see a classical conditioning. Again, there are going to be two variations. One is called as the classical conditioning. Here, the association of an unconditional sti unconditioned stimulus with the conditioned stimulus. So, again, there are going to be two things. One is actually unconditioned stimulus. The second one is a conditioned stimulus. U s, this is called a C s, we can call them. And C s is such as a flash of light or a sound tone produces weak response. And this U s is such as food or shock to the leg produces strong response. Now, we will see a simple example of course, let us not complicate the things right. If a flash of light is always followed by serving a meat to a dog right. So, there is going to be a dog and whenever you flash a light, then the dog understands that I will be provided with some food right. So, first there is going to be unconditional stimulus followed by a conditional stimulus. So, here if a flash of light is always followed by serving a meat to a dog, after a number of learning trials, the light itself begins to produce the salivation right. So, immediately the dog will be ready to eat the meat. So, here actually what happens two operations which are associated. The first operation is flashing of the light, the second operation is serving the meat. So, these two operations are associative that is actually called as the classical conditioning one example. The second one is going to be the operant conditioning. In that case, the formation of a predictive relationship between a stimulus and a response. Here again there is a thing, a simple hungry rat right in a cage, which has a uh, lever on one of its walls. So, measure the spontaneous rate at which the rate possess the lever, the process the lever by virtue of its random movement around the cage. If the rat is promptly presented with food, whenever the lever is pressed, the spontaneous rate of lever pressing increases. Suppose, when the uh, rat presses that particular lever, then it is getting some food, right. So, whenever the uh, rat presses the lever, then it is going to be completely continuously getting the food. So, automatically what happens? The frequency of pressing will increase because at some point of time the rat understands that whenever I press this particular lever, I will be getting some food right. Of course, the rat is there inside the cage and it is a hungry rat. So, whenever there is going to be a sequence of operations, when one thing is done followed by the other thing is also going to happen. In that case, we can have a classical conditioning and a operant conditioning. The next one is going to be the non-associative learning. And non-associative means of course, they are uh, not associated with each other right. Already we discussed this. A non-associative learning is another variety of learning in which an association between the stimuli does not take place. To be more uh, descriptive, in non-associative learning the behavior and stimulus are not paired and linked together right. So, we are giving uh, of course, we, uh, we saw in the last example right. A dog is given a flashlight and then it is given a food. So, these two things actually it associates. Whenever there is a light is flashed, then it will get some food. So, there are two associative operations, but here actually there is no associative operation here. So, here it is going to be non-associative learning and the behavior and the stimulus are not paired or linked together. And this form of associative learning is quite common in animals. We will again see some examples here. Here there are going to be the first example is the habituation right. So, the habituation means when the responsiveness of an organism is repeatedly exposed to stimulus decreases. Similar, similar simply it is when a person or animal reacts less and less to something due to exposure. For example, just imagine a child who is always being scolded right. The first time actually the child will react right. So, whenever uh, he or she is getting scolded immediately the child will start uh, crying. But when you do it plenty of times, what will happen actually it will become a habit. So, the child will get accustomed to the scolding. So, the child reacts less and less. So, that will become a habit of that particular child. So, getting scolded. So, the, the sensitivity of that particular child we can say it is going to continuously reduce this. That is actually called as the habituation. The next one is of course, the sensitization is when the responsiveness of an organism to a repeatedly exposed stimulus increases or else the person or animal reacts even more when 
each time it is exposed to similar. So, of course, it is going to be the uh, ultra of the previous case. So, so, it will get more sensitive whenever it is given to some stimulus. Right.